This is Phil Kopman with a tutorial on floating point math and all the weird stuff that accompanies using it. Floating point math is an approximation to real numbers, in other words, things beyond integers. Perhaps the most common floating point format is the IEEE 32 bit single precision floating point format, which is what we'll be discussing. That format takes 32 bits and arranges them as a 1 bit sign, so that's plus or minus an 8-bit exponent, and a 23-bit mantissa. The value represented by a floating point number is the sign bit gives you a plus or minus. There's an implicit 1, a radix point, 1 dot mantissa value, times 2 to the power of exponent minus 127. Breaking it down, the sign is 0 is positive, 1 is negative. The exponent is not a 2's complement number, but rather is 127 bias radix 2. So what that means is you take the exponent, you subtract 127. Therefore, 2 to the 0 is an exponent value of 127. The mantissa has an implicit leading 1. So the value is always 1 dot mantissa value. The reason for this is that under normal circumstances, the floating point value is normalized so that the exponent is adjusted so that there's a 1 dot something and there's no point spending a bit on a 1 that's always there. There are other special values we'll get to in a moment, but the first special value is that 0 is represented by all 0 bits. In floating point math, the general idea is that there's an exponent plus a mantissa representation. The 32-bit format we just discussed is quite common, but there's a 64-bit version that looks pretty much the same, follows the same rules, except the exponent and the mantissa have more bits in them. A significant issue with floating point math is that you can get round off errors because there are only so many bits. And we'll see how that plays out in subsequent slides. Beyond zero, there are other special values. There's infinity, not a number also called a nan, denormalized numbers that do not have the implicit one dot in front of the mantissa, and there's even a sign zero. We'll get to all those things. The anti-patterns for floating point math include not accounting for round off errors, which affects tests for floating point equality, not handling special values, and using floats if you really should have used an integer. Despite the fact that floating point numbers have this exponent that lets you represent big numbers, sometimes that's the wrong choice and you should be using an integer instead. Perhaps the most famous problem with floating point numbers is round off errors. Rounding errors occur because you only have 24 bits to work with in the mantissa, including the leading one. That means if you have all zero mantissa bits, it's 1 dot 23 zeros base 2. If you have more than 24 bits of value, they won't fit. While this sounds obvious, the implications can be a little subtle. For example, if you have a 32-bit integer and convert it to a floating point value and back, you'll get corrupted bottom bits. Here's an example where the bottom bits are 73 hex. You convert it to a floating point value, you convert it back, and you see the result is 80 hex. What happened there is that the bottom seven bits got chopped off and the result was rounded. It's still the same floating point value, but you've tossed away seven bits for the integer. Okay, well that might not be so bad, but when you start accumulating those randoff errors in a consecutive set of computations, the results can be much worse. A fundamental issue is that IEEE 754, which is the IEEE floating point standard, is radix 2. That means the mantissa is base 2. Humans are used to thinking in base 10. Well, base 2 and base 10 result in different fraction representations that are inexact. The classic example is 0 0.1, 1 tenth in decimal, is not exactly representable as a fixed number of bits in binary. It's a continuing decimal that repeats, which means if you convert 0.1 to a floating point value, you will get an inexact number. On the right is a computer program where all I did was add 0.1 repeatedly and print it out. Note that the printouts usually don't include quite all the bits, and there's some funny stuff going on with rounding to usually give you the right result. So you get 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, but then around 2.6, you get 2.6, 2.7, and you get 2.799999. What's going on here? Well, the round off error of continually adding something that is a little bit less than 0.1 is catching up to you, and all of a sudden you're seeing it. By the time you get to 99, it's 99.999046, 
it's pretty far off. This leads to a fundamental floating point comparison pitfall. If you take two floating point numbers that have been created by different computations and test them for equality, they might not match, even if it's the same computation. If the operations were done in different orders, the roundoff might have occurred differently. And while algebra says they should be equal, they're not actually going to be equal on the computer. Sometimes there's a workaround where you do an approximately equal test, such as saying if the values are close together or normalized for the size of the value, well, we'll call it close enough. But the result is that if you have floating point computation, the order of evaluation matters, and the results in general cannot be expected to be equal from two different computations with different orders of evaluation. Watch out for this one. You might say, round off error, well, how bad could it be? Well, in fact, round off error actually led to some deaths in 1991. One of the biggest mistakes to use in floating point is using a 32-bit floating point value to represent time. Here's the story. Back in 1991, during Operation Desert Storm, there were SCUD missiles being launched, and the Patriot missile system was deployed to intercept and shoot down those incoming ballistic SCUD missiles. According to the investigation report, what happened was, after about 20 hours of continuous running, the time calculation became so inaccurate due to roundoff error that the radar looked in the wrong place for the incoming missile. That means when the Patriot missile interceptor was launched, it was pointing and guided to the wrong place and missed hitting the incoming scud. A range gate was used to look at where the target is protected to be next. And the target track is lost if the range gate is wrong, resulting in a miss. Let's switch to a picture of what happened, and then we'll come back to this slide. The incoming missile, which is the SCUD missile on the arc in this picture, first is detected by a radar pulse saying, OK, there's something out there. But because these things move very fast, you need more pulses in the air than one at a time to be able to get frequent enough updates due to the limitations of speed of light. So a classic radar system of this type will actually put out multiple pulses and it will know about where the target is so it knows which pulse represents the target distance. So you look at this picture, there might be four or five pulses in the air, but it knows, okay, the incoming missile is about so far away, so this is the pulse about where it is. In order to know where it is now, it has to know where it used to be and estimate the velocity and trajectory. So this radar runs a target tracker to figure out about where the missile is going to be so it knows which pulse to pay attention to for very precise and high frequency updates. However, this system represented in time in tenths of a second. In one part of the system, it was integer tenths of a second, but then it converted to a floating point value that accumulated over time. If you keep adding tenths of a second at 100 hours, the roundoff error is enough to cause a problem. In this case, after 100 hours of operation of this floating point time value being accumulated in one subsystem and an integer time value in another, the two subsystems disagreed by about a third of a second, which is almost 700 meters. The result was, after 100 hours, the range gate computation was off enough that it was tracking the wrong pulse, and it thought the missile was in a different location than it really was. Thus, when the interceptor was shot, it was shooting at the wrong location. It was shooting down by the red circle when the real missile was further away. Going back to the previous slide, what was the root cause of this? Well, really, it boils down to using floating point for time. But the backstory is the Patriot missile system was never designed for intercepting ballistic missiles. Instead, it was designed for intercepting high-speed aircraft back in the Cold War with a frontier against the Soviet Union. SCUD missiles travel faster than aircraft, and it was assumed that the Patriot would be relocated frequently and would never sit in one place and run for 100 hours when it was actively monitoring for incoming aircraft. The takeaway is even a very small roundoff error, if you iterate across it, so time was going 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and so on, and after 100 hours, time was sufficiently far off in the floating point compared to the integer tenths of a second that a distance computation based on velocity times time came up with the wrong answer, and when they shot at the ballistic missile, they missed. The moral of this story is do not ever use 32-bit floating point to represent time. It will eventually come back to bite you.
When dealing with IEEE floating point, it's important to realize that there are special values you have to consider. Reviewing, the floating point value is a 1-bit sign, an 8-bit exponent, and a 23-bit mantista. So the unexceptional value 1.0 would have a sign bit of 0 because it's a positive number, 3F8 in the exponent, which is decimal 127, which means exponent value of 0, and a mantissa of all zeros because there's a leading 1. So the way to read this is plus 1.0 times 2 to the 0. Note that the point is a radix value instead of a decimal point because it's base 2, so it's radix 2 point. The exponent value is used to indicate special values. The lowest exponent value and the highest exponent value both mean something's different. It's not interpreted the way we just did. If the exponent's all zeros, that's either a positive zero or a minus zero, and in normal math, you'd expect those to equal each other even though they're different representations of zero. If the exponent is the highest value, then you get another set of special values, such as infinity, where the mantissa is zero, or different types of not a numbers. There's a signaling number or a quiet number, where signaling generally throws an exception, and quiet numbers are just quietly continued through the computation. Taking these in turn, infinity is what you get when you divide by zero, or you get an overflow error. Denormalized numbers, which are a different exponent value, are numbers smaller than the smallest fraction. The idea behind a denormalized number is that the leading bit on the mantissa is an implicit zero instead of an implicit one, which gives you a few more smaller exponent values you can use in practice by having a bunch of leading zeros in the mantissa at the expense of some precision. Not a number, nan, is what you get when you take the square root of a negative number or some other undefined operation. A signaling NAN throws an exception, but the default is usually a silent NAN, where NANs propagate throughout the computation. Taking the simple view, anytime there's a computation and there's a NAN anywhere involved, the result is going to be a NAN. That means it's pretty easy, if you have a numeric issue in your computation, to have an output of a NAN, and then you have to decide what you're going to do about that. There's a classic failure in embedded systems of a silent NAN comparison pitfall. Comparison with a NAN is almost always false, and that leads to issues such as speed limit checks that fail, and we've seen this in real systems. If you say, if the current speed is greater than the speed limit, do a shutdown. But if the current speed is NAN, there's no shutdown, because NAN greater than speed limit is defined to be false. Somewhat surprisingly, asking if NAN equals NAN is also false, so you should use the function isNAN in the C programming language instead. As you can see, special value rules can be tricky, and it's well worth your while to read a more extensive discussion of these topics before you do critical computations involving floating point numbers. Here's a concrete example of what happens when you generate a NAN in a computation and rely on the result of that computation for control. This is a fault injection test on a robotic test platform that had been used for many years without incident, in which my research team injected a NAN as a speed value. We found out that the software correctly enforced the speed limit with infinity, because the comparison is infinity greater than speed limit results are true. But when we put in a NAN, the software in fact had the bug that it compared NAN with the speed limit and got a false and allowed the system to go past its speed limit, resulting in a control loop destabilization. So that you can see for yourself, I'll run the video from that experiment next. The Stress Testing of Autonomy Architectures project is developing tools that can efficiently uncover safety and robustness vulnerabilities in unmanned vehicles. Here, our tool is exercising the safety critical speed limits of an unmanned ground vehicle. It heuristically explores the command space of the vehicle's black box interfaces and monitors invariants to discover when failures occur. At this point, a command sent by our tool causes the vehicle's speed limit to be violated. Our tool logs commands and feedback to support root cause analysis and can optionally issue safing commands when invariants are violated. There are a number of best practices for floating point. The first best practice is don't use floating point if you can find another way to do it. If the Patriot system had used scaled integer in tenths of a second for time accumulation on all of its different subsystems, 
the mishap we talked about would not have happened. That means a simple solution is simply count time in tenths of a second or hundredths of a second in an integer and bypass the round-off error issue entirely. An alternate approach is to use a technique called binary coded decimal, BCD, with a radix point. You have to pick the right number of digits, and it's not nearly as efficient as binary floating point, but it will get the job done and gets rid of the round-off error problem. This technique is commonly used in banking to avoid round-off error in bank sums. A third technique is to use fixed point, which is quite common in embedded systems. In fixed point, you take an integer and you interpret it as a scaled integer, but with even powers of two of scaling. One example is a 32-bit value, which is considered to be 24 bits of integer and 8 bits of fraction. You can add these up using normal integer math and get a correct answer. Multiply and divide also use integer instructions, but you have to move the radix point around after you're done, just like you learned in grade school. As a rule of thumb, use scaled integer if you can, use fixed point if you must, or BCD for some applications, and use floating point only if it's okay if you don't actually get quite the right answer and you're going to deal with round off error. Make sure to handle special values. Once you've taken a bite out of the floating point apple, you need to deal with NANDs and infinities and all these things, and NAND is especially tricky to get right. In your code, make sure you know if you've generated a NAND because you can get some weird results, especially if you're doing threshold calculations as we saw. Be sure to manage and handle Randolph error. Going to double floating points helps a lot. It gives you a 53-bit mantissa, but you will still get Randolph error. All these issues are there. They just take longer to manifest. Avoid using floating point as an iterator for a loop, especially using floating point as time. And don't forget, comparisons are especially problematic due to both round-off and comparisons against special numbers.